we will have a short introduction of our guest who does not need any introduction. Um, okay, a uh, short introduction. Actually, as I said, uh, our guest speaker needs no introduction because he's really a, a favorite of MVP. Uh, he is Professor Michael Xiao Chua. He is uh, a graduate of the University of the Philippines. He teaches at the De La Salle University and he is a superstar both in uh, mainstream media and the social media. So uh, let's have uh, Xiao Chua, please. Xiao. Okay. Uh, I always greet my followers on television, makasaysayang araw po sa ating lahat. Um, I was, uh, this is a, like a privileged speech in Congress where I'm supposed to talk about any subject, I'm joking, but uh, the question that was uh, um, raised for me to talk about is what is the role of the historian in the coming elections and in elections in general? Okay, I would like to first um, give some assumptions of people about the discipline of history. And number one, that history is neutral, that history can be unbiased, that history, that there is objectivity in history. Okay, and that's why, because of this assumption, that historians are supposedly totally objective like scientists or hard scientists like physician uh like uh, physicists chemists uh, uh that uh, this because it's the social sciences are a discipline that uh, supposedly they're not uh prone to bias and should be objective now this is something that uh, we should clarify because of this assumption, people are saying that historians should not have political stand in elections. That's one. People are always saying that to me. When I say that, you know, I mean, it's it's obvious to some people, and because we're talking about politics, I have to be portrayed about you, that I am campaigning for Lenny Robredo. Not in a very active way, but uh, I am uh, in a way supporting her. Now, if you're going to look at it, people are saying, why are you uh, support, openly supporting a candidate? Doesn't it destroy your credibility? Because you're supposed to be uh, objective. Objective. And the notion of objectivity is that uh, uh, you are not taking sides. That you're only just stating the facts. This is one assumption that we should clarify, number one. So, if there is a, uh, this as well, if there is this assumption, then what is the role of the historian? And probably he should, he should not or she should not participate in electioneering, right? So that is one assumption. So I'm going to begin with that. The first role of the historian in election is really to be a warning. Huh? Why? Okay. It is not true that historians can be totally objective. The late Teodoro Agoncillo already said that uh, there is no such thing as objectivity in history. Huh? If you are an objective historian, you are zero. Sabi niyang ganyan. He, he said. And in one, in another essay, that's his interview with Ambeto Campo. Okay? In another essay, he said that humans are, humans have biases. Humans have uh uh what do you call this 
they have a background. They have a cultural preference. They are part of a culture and therefore are, are uh, favoring, for example, a Filipino perspective like what he did, more than an, a Western perspective perhaps. So in that case, since we are all humans and we are prone to uh, be associated with, with a group of people, therefore, we should not deny that humanity among historians. That is what Teodoro Agoncillo said. And so, uh, for me, you can only be totally, obje uh, you, can, you cannot be totally objective. But I also believe that historians cannot be totally partisan. And we should clarify this. Yes, we can be partisan, but we cannot be totally partisan to the point that we lie for our candidates. Okay? Now, this is the same dilemma with uh, priests. Supposedly, priests, because of the, the so-called assumption of people in their interpretation of the separation of church and state, that priests are not allowed to endorse candidates. But that's bullshit. We all know that's bullshit because the, the guarantee for the separation of church and state only states that there is no state religion in the Philippines that will be funded by the government. The priests can speak about politics, can, can talk about candidates. Why? Because they have free speech according to Article 3 of the Constitution because they're citizens of the Republic. Same with historians. We have the right to speak our minds. But I believe that it is unethical to be totally partisan in the sense that some people in the campaign are already acting as propagandists. And this I want to avoid doing. Now, when, when, when some of our friends in our campaign already make exaggerated claims about the candidates. Or shall we say um, to, to, to make someone look good so that, you know, he can be electable or such, such things. Uh, if, if that is, I can only be partisan to the point that I will say the truth. And that, and, and that is why if you're going to look at it, even if, uh, we are part of Lenny's com uh, campaign, not in an active way, but in a passive way. If I see something wrong about the narrative that they're giving or the attitude of some of the supporters, especially if they are talking about supporters of the other side as poor people, uh, you know, we, when we go, to, we are not bayaran, we are not paid, we go to Starbucks and you poor people who vote for Bong Bong, you cannot even afford Starbucks, so how can we not be paid? You know, I always tell them, you know, do not say that, do not say that, because we are going to turn off the people that we want to, to convince to join us. But because people were hurt, that's why they they say such things, politically incorrect. You know, when you're hurt, you want to insult them. When you are being insulted, you want to insult as well. And so you say politically incorrect things. So, the first role of the historian is to be a warning. That when we demolish the fact that historians can be objective or cannot be ob totally objective, but can be objective by being fair, okay, to the point of fairness, meaning even if I'm partisan, I will, for example, I will not say lies about Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, I will not, if, if he had achievements, I will have to to acknowledge that Ferdinand Marcos, senior, okay, senior, the father, because you know, they're using the son, they're using the father to elect the son. So there are claims about uh, some of the achievements of the Marcos, as I will not belie them, even if I am from the other camp. So once we have established that historians can be not, to, I, I cannot be totally objective, but can be objective to the point of, um, to the point of being fair and will not lie for their candidates, then we can always say that historians 
the first thing about historians is they should serve as warnings. Or they should serve warnings. Why? Okay. When I teach that history is useful, when I teach that history can uh, change people's lives, not, not the history itself, but when you view history and learn the lessons of history and apply the lessons to, to decision-making that you have, the first thing in my mind is actually elections. Historians should assist the people by serving as warning to the people that, hey, there might be some people or kinds of people that you should not elect. And there are kinds of people that you should elect. Because in history, we have shown that they, these kinds of people have acted a certain way already. They have a pattern. And the, the first thing, how do you know that? How do you know the pattern of behavior of the leaders? You have to look at the track record. And the historians know the track record, at least, of the major candidates. And if there are local historians, they could also learn about the candidates of the uh, of the local scene, the local elections. So, what I am saying here is uh, that uh, because historians have a knowledge of the past of the families, because you know uh, we all know this that uh, a lot of the people who run, they are running in the context of their families, of their political clans. A lot of them. So what is the history of this clan? What is the history of this family? Or if this is a newbie, a newbie candidate, the historian or the researcher will have the capacity to, uh, will have the methodology to actually investigate on these new candidates that are emerging. Because the knowledge of the past and the knowledge of the biography tells something about the the, the, the candidates uh, candidates' way of decision making that will help you see if he is suitable for election. So yes, the historian serves as a warning during elections of what kind of people should we not vote. And also remind us of the people that we should vote. And that's why a lot of historians now are taking that side. Or taking that predicament already. That they are going to come out in open to say that, that this person is the person that we want to be elected. We want elected because she possesses, she or he possesses the qualities that we need for a leader. And certain candidates should not be elected because they're all only standing on the shoulders of their fathers or mothers. You know what I mean. Hmm? Now, I would like to go to the second point that I would like to make. Historians have a role in elections because Hopefully, historians will remind people how important it is to vote and what is at stake. So how do we do that? One, if there are economic historians that they can, you know, they can have uh, forecasts that are based on what happened in the past about the economy, if certain uh, styles of leadership or ideology that are can, that candidates would bring if they get elected, what kind of economy will we, we will have or something like that. That's one thing. And so you show people this is at stake. So for example, I am an educator. If a Bongbong Marcos, for example, will win the presidency, what kind of educational system will happen in the country? It's probably more of a science. My, my, my prediction is it's more of a more scientific. And they will probably not mind history 
Or if they will mind history, they're going to probably do something about the record of the father. Huh? But you know, uh, in all fairness, uh, it's painful that the history education has always been neglected by a lot of the leaders that were elected in the past. Hmm. And I do not see, I do not, uh, hopefully, if Lenny Robredo wins, that he will, she will do something about the because we have already learned our lessons. You know, the Aquinos did not do something about history because they felt that if they're going to do something about history, it would be self-serving. Uh, because the, they thought that in promoting history, especially people power and the Marcos rule, that they are, um, they will be glorifying themselves. Now, we, we all know that what happened is that backfired because eventually that became the entry point for historical revision or as historical negation, neg negative historical revision or historical distortion that happened. Because I do not want to call it historical revision because we revise history all the time when we have new data. So I really do not know. What kind of... Uh, uh, Okay, sorry. Um, and so, if uh, that's one thing that 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 historians should should do, is to look at uh, for uh, forecasting in a way based on the past on on what the candidates were standing on about what kind what is at stake when we elect certain leaders, what is at stake at the elections. So that if you do not vote, then this is what can happen to us. If we, if we, we either we let the right candidate win, or we let the wrong candidate win. And again, as I tell you, it will all be, be uh, it will all depend on whose historian we are talking to, because again. As there are many historians in the country, there are as many historians as their opinions of certain candidates. Although you see that there are patterns where we are actually, a lot of us are actually in the same boat. Now, the other way to tell people why it is important to vote is to let them realize how hard it was before to get this right to vote. And how hard it was to actually uh, get this right and to exercise it for many, many years by the majority of the people. And this is where I go to, I, 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 I give talks to Botomo or Bayan Mo Ipatrol Mo of ABS-CBN in various communities of the poor, uh, in the many urban areas where I actually talk about, I give talks before the pandemic, uh, every elections, about why is it important to vote by looking at our history. So I hope that I will, I will use the remaining minutes of my time to give you a little bit of what I tell them. What is the importance of, uh, of, of elections? in the Philippines. So remember that we should understand elections. The elections in the Philippines have actually, oh, wait a minute. Um, so, you know, elections in the Philippines are actually, if you're going to look at it, uh, it, it, it is not just a political exercise. <laughs> you know? It's not. It's not just a political exercise. It's actually where we put a lot of our culture in. Huh? So elections are not just political exercises. They're actually zarzuela. They're theatrical. They're entertainment. They're carnival. They're, they're films. They're, they're piesta rolled into one. Huh? Where it, th there are actually villains and there are actually bida and you know, and, and, and there are, there's the people. There's, it, it can be, it's a box office hit. No? With heroes and villains. You see? 
and uh, production numbers. You see, that's why a lot of uh, candidates actually, actually does. You know, in the Philippines, we have uh, elevated the art of electioneering uh, because, in many ways, it is the you know instead of act instead of actors following politicians in how they look presidential it is actually some of the lawyers politicians who act like actors and dance around you know like 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 uh, dancing bears oh, to please their audience to please their master the filipino people you see so they dance a lot and they have you know uh videos and all of that now i would like to emphasize this uh, that uh, it, we cannot actually take away the cultural element of elections. So we'll say na, oh, you, let's take away the entertainment. No, it's all part of that. It's all part of that. Huh? Before the coming of the Spaniards, even if we have a DATO system, remember that in many ways, uh, the DATOs and their families are, uh, are there because they are because they are supported by the people. Huh? If the people do not like them anymore, a challenger will appear, and they're going to you know take uh, going to challenge them and to a battle to a to a uh, to combat they can be replaced. Huh? So the main point here I would like to emphasize is that even if you have a political family. Like the Datus before, they were the political families. If the people do not like you anymore, they can replace you. But this is where we see that we have an affinity to ruling families, even before the coming of the Spaniards. But once you are inept, once you do not prove that you're the best warrior, once you do not prove that you're the best administration, administrator, once the Babaylan who was the spiritual leader, is telling people that the gods are not favoring you or God is not favoring you, then you can be replaced. Oh, so in many ways, there is a certain uh, tinge of democracy in the way our ancestors ruled at that time. You have to be approved by the people. It's not, certain, it's not just certain divine right. You can lose that divine right if the people do not like you anymore. Uh, and so that is how it was during the time of our ancestors. Now, of course, the Spaniards came and imposed the colonial system. And what happened was the Datus, the Datu families, instead of antagonizing them, they were taken inside the what we call the colonial system. They were appropriated by the Spaniards because they serve as uh what they call this they can serve as uh, uh the mediator between the people and the spanish government that is why if you're going to look at it the datus became what we call the principalias the principalias became the tax tax collectors of the spaniards and they can be elected and this is our a few rich indios not so rich, but, you know, they have relative wealth. And they can be elected to as high as mayor of the town. So they can be cabezas de barangay, and they can be what we call uh, uh, gobernador silio, or town mayor. So if you're going to look at, the, at that time, they have elections, actually, especially in the 19th century. They started to have elections. And if, if the... There are only 13 people, around 13 people, electing each other. So the right to vote was uh, very much limited, not to all people, but only to the rich. Only to those who have blood of the Datus, the Principalia. And in many ways, a lot of the families today, like for example, you know the family of Gloria Arroyo? Gloria Macapagal Arroyo was married to an Arroyo, Tuason Arroyo. They are descended uh, from Lacandula. Okay? So a lot of these families actually descended from the old. That's why the old rich, they call them. Okay? So they still make up a lot of uh, the political families in the Philippines.
there are also a lot of new ones that emerged. But anyway, remember that uh, our actually our, as our first national election was the election of Andres Bonifacio, which is one of the favorite topics of uh, MBP. You know, uh, of course, Andres Bonifacio was already the uh, was already the president of the Katipunan government, okay, that was initiated in August 24 of 1896, except that, of course, they were challenged by the people of Cavite in March uh, 22. Actually, wow, we, we, we've actually picked a good anniversary, you see, because, uh, because uh, it, I think it was yesterday, it's in March 21, right? The Tejeros Convention. Yeah, uh, March 22. Yeah, March 22. The Tejeros Convention. Uh, March 22. Uh, yeah, that was yesterday. Was the anniversary of the first quote-unquote national election in the Philippines. Uh, and it was uh, to, to actually fix the problem of infighting between the Katipunan in Cavite. But because they were talking about changing government, Andres Bonifacio, maybe because he thought that he will win, agreed to an election that will replace his government. And when he already uh, accepted defeat from Emilio Aguinaldo, he was actually insulted by one of the people by saying that he was uneducated and so he should not take a position where Bonifacio was elected, a lower one. And this insult uh, by one of the delegates of the Tejeros Convention, and you know how they did it? Uh, at first, they have ballots. And in fact, there was a an insinuation from one of the friends of Bonifacio that uh, there were uh, more ballots than people and that they were already filled up. <laughs> so you see, I cannot confirm if it was real. And Bonifacio dismissed the allegations of that friend of his. He said, I don't believe, I don't, I, I trust the people. Bonifacio, he did not listen to those people who are saying, you know, you have been cheated in this election. And so he lost, right? I do not confirm, neither deny that there was cheating. I'm only saying that in the first national election in the Philippines, there were already rumors of Dagdag Bawas. You know, Dagdag Bawas, you know, right? When you when you increase the number of the, the loser and you decrease the number of the winner, <laughs> of the real winner, and therefore another winner will emerge. I hope you're still okay uh, about the stories that I tell. And please do not be bored. Uh, no, uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, and so that that insult to Bonifacio, and Bonifacio walked out and nullified the election, not only divided the revolution, but it resulted to what I believe is the first election-related violence OERB. Because when Bonifacio... Uh, insisted that he's still the president and the others were insisting that Emilio Aguinaldo became the president, one of them has to die. And Aguinaldo ordered the killing of Andres Bonifacio eventually. That's a long story and I will not tell you. Now, of course what happened was, eventually Emilio Aguinaldo was able to establish his hold on power and Emilio Aguinaldo in all fairness to him uh, actually wanted, you know, I tell you, when, Aguina when Aguinaldo declared Philippine independence, hmm, it was a revolutionary government. Mabini, Apolinario Mabini, said, you know, do not, do not declare independence. It's better to have a dictatorial government. Mabini said that the president should have a greater power in a revolution because this is a time of emergency. In all fairness to Aguinaldo, Aguinaldo already wanted to show the world that we are a civilized people, that we want democracy. And so, while we were having war with the Americans, well, not yet, okay, not yet, but there are rumors that 
the Americans will invade us because they're here already, but they will invade us and they will have war with us. Aguinaldo was busy organizing this Congress to make it appear that there is a semblance of democracy because he did not want to be called a dictator. And you know what happened there? Because they wanted to create a constitution. You know, Mabini said, don't create a constitution. Because the constitution, uh, we do not need a constitution now. We only need the uh, terms of war. Because we're at a war. And then we do not need a congress because the president should be the sole person deciding in a war. We do not need a congress. But Aguinaldo want, want, and, 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 and the Aguinaldo and the businessmen already wanted to, you know, be seated there and be part of the government. And that's why they said, you know, Aguinaldo, please uh, create the Congress now. And they created the Congress. The first, uh, the, the, the Congress of the Philippines in, in Malolos. And they picked people, for example, the Tarlac General of the Revolution, Francisco Macabulo, since he is the near one here, was picked as the deputy from Cebu. So the deputies were representing places that they did not even went to. Because they were they just wanted to have a semblance that this is a representative democracy. So there's a delegate of Cebu, delegate of this province, delegate of this province. And they created the first constitutional uh, democratic republic in Asia, which was uh in uh, which was organized in January of 1899. And so I would just like to show photos of that there, there. So that is what happened. And so this is a Polinario Mabini. This is the Malolos Congress. Uh huh. Uh, if you're going to look at it, uh, you know I want to read this to you. Eh, uh, Mabini actually gave us, and I'm going to read the English version of the Decalogue where he actually talks about what kind of leaders we should have. And this is another uh, uh, role of the historian, is to actually ask people to uh, talk about what our heroes wanted for a leader. Huh? So let us read the true Decalogue. I'll read portions of it. Huh? Ayan. Number seven of the Decalogue, the true Decalogue of Mabini. Thou shalt not recognize in thy country the authority of any person who has not been elected by thee and thy countrymen. For authority emanates from God, and as God speaks in the conscience of every man, the person designated and proclaimed by the conscience of a whole people is the only one who can use true authority. Number eight, thou shalt strive for a republic and never for a monarchy in thy country. For the latter exalts one or several families and founds a dynasty. The former makes a people noble and worthy through reason, great through liberty, and prosperous and brilliant through labor. Hmm? So there you go. Huh? Therefore, he said, as long as national frontiers subsist, race and maintained by the selfishness of race and family, with thy countrymen alone shall thou unite in a perfect solidarity of purpose and interest, in order to have force and only to resist the common enemy, but also to attain all the aims of human life. So basically, Mabini is telling us that the reason for having elections and the reason for having government is that people should, can have a good life. And that we gave the authority, the people's voice, to their leaders, because the voice of the people is the voice of God. So that's why we should respect what the people elected. Who the people I mean elected. Okay, that's what that's what Apollinario Mabini said. I, I, I'm actually searching for a Mabini quote uh, about uh, people that should be in the Senate. Because this is something that uh, uh, something that uh, is very good. Uh huh. Wait a minute, ah. Mabini character. Senate. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
okay as a section under Facebook. Okay, it's a very good, it's a very good quote, no? uh, Mabini Senado. Okay, there you go. I'm going to translate this in English. Uh, it says here, I'll read it first in Tagalog. Ang Senado ay lubos na kagalang-galang na kinawakoonan ng mga taong lalong hirang dahil sa kausayan ng ugali at sa nalalaman sa anumang sanga ng karunungan, sanga ng karunungan at paghahanap buhay. Kaya't walang makakakiyat dito kundi yung mga piling mamamayan na nagpapakita ng di karaniwang talas ng isip at kasipagan. Which in English says, the Senate is a very high and uh, respected or ano, uh, respected, uh, ano nga yung tagalang-galang uh, uh, association? Most venerable. The Senate is the most venerable chamber where the people that should be elected are really chosen. Hirang. Because of their excellence. Excellence and good character, kausayan ng ugali, and their knowledge in any kind of or any any branch of knowledge and uh, or talents or 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 shall we say um, um, work. No one should be elevated to the Senate, no? uh, but. Only those that are really chosen oh, and are chosen because they have extraordinary uh, mind and kasipagan, uh, uh, work, work ethic. So our heroes already tell, told us what kind of leaders we should have. Huh? We cannot elect leaders that did not have any achievement when they were when they were elected in previous positions. That is very clear. No achievement. <laughs> Number one in survey. No achievement. <laughs> now, let's proceed. The Americans came, and in fairness to them. They established a civil government with a civil election that happened in, uh, I think, 1906. Hmm? And who were the people who should be elected according to this, um, shall we say, uh, civil thing? And this is what I remind Filipinos of. I'm sorry if I am, I, I will try to finish uh, soon. I am just very sorry that I actually prepared something. I thought that I'm going to just talk, but uh, uh, instead I am now uh, lecturing. Uh, look at this. Yan. It's the Philippine Assembly election of 1906. And the only ones that, 1907 I mean, and the only ones who were able to um, elect were, uh, only ones who were able to, to cast a ballot were 23 years old and above. Male, so females were not allowed. Those who have property, those who pay taxes, those who have education, those who knew how to speak English and Spanish. So only one to two percent of the populace were able to vote. So this is not true democracy. This is elite democracy. And in many ways, that elite democracy still lingers on today. And so they were the ones the they were the, the local leaders were the ones who go around. So, for example, Quezon doesn't have to go around the country to be elected in the Commonwealth elections because there were local leaders who worked to do that for him. And uh, they have radio sets where Quezon, as a candidate, can actually speak to the people through the radio. And, and Quezon became adept about this uh, new kind of technology at that time. So this is how they were able to elect the Philippine Assembly and eventually the Philippine Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, and that is also the beginning of Osmeña and Quezon's uh, rise to power, uh, 50, uh, around the half a century of their prominence in the elections. Now, the women, the women were not able to vote until Quezon, actually, he thought that even if he's a macho guy, thought that uh, 
uh, allowing women to vote will be good for him. So what happened was he, he actually told the women to let's have a referendum and if you collect a certain number of 100,000 signatures and they were able to exceed that and they were able to elect, have a, be part of the elections in 1937. So there we go. Um, now, there were, there were times when uh, there were some noteworthy election-related violence that I can, you know, talk about very briefly. And this one involves a friend of President Elpidio Quirino. His name was uh, Laxon from Negros. Okay? Uh, Rafael Laxon, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Uh, and Rafael Laxon had a uh, had candidates in his uh, province in Negros and uh, in Negros Occidental and in one uh, one town Magallon he fielded the candidate his own candidate and he was challenged by a person named Moises Padilla. Now this Moises Padilla guy by challenging a person. Uh, uh, that was uh, blessed by Rafael Laxon. He thought that his life would be in danger, endangered. And then it, and so he told his mother, you know, he told his mother that uh, if something happens to me, contact um, Ramon Magsaysay. Ma Ramon Magsaysay at that time was the Secretary of Defense of Quirino. But despite the fact that Rafael Laxon, Quirino, and Magsaysay were part of the same party, uh, which was the Liberal Party at that time. Uh, they, he actually trusted Magsaysay. Rafael Laxon. Uh, no, 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 sorry, Moises Padilla. And so what happened was, Moises Padilla was abducted. He was abducted, I think before the elections or after, I forgot that he was abducted. And then when they found his body, it was mutilated. They even dragged his body around the town. And so that is why when the mother so what happened to his son? He contacted the defense secretary Magsaysay. And Magsaysay uh, went. He, he, flo he, 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 he used a plane, of course, with Nino Aquino and Chino Roses uh, of the Manila Times. And, they, and, and, and this is one, 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 one story that happened. When the, late, when the plane landed, this is how powerful some elected officials could be in a local town. When the plane landed, nobody even bothered to welcome them. This was the President of the Republic. Ah, uh, no, Defense, Defense Secretary of the Republic. Nobody bothered to welcome them. Nobody escorted them where the, everyone was afraid. The lights were off and they were only able to find the house of Moises Padilla because they saw a light. Because that the people were already there. Uh, some, some people were already there. And they were already... Um, and they were already viewing the body of Moises Padilla, who was not, not even in a coffin. And so, and so what happened was Magsaysay uh, carried the body of Moises Padilla uh, for an for a autopsy. Uh, and even if Magsaysay was Quirino's man, in fact, he was, his political fortunes he owed to Quirino, he filed cases against Rafael Laxon and his men. And Rafael Laxon was jailed for the being the mastermind of this crime. And eventually, of course, Magsaysay will bolt out of Quirino because the CIA will talk to him, you know, to run against Quirino. <laughs> and Magsaysay saw an opportunity there. And so he bolted. And, you know, he always talk about it in his election campaign, Magsaysay, for president. He said, when I held, I held the body of Moises Padilla, and when I held it in my arms, it is as if I held the broken body of our nation. Boom! And Magsaysay, with the help of the Americans and some of his friends, was able to invent PR during elections. The, the PR, very systematized PR. There were PM before, but not as systematized as Magsaysay. You know, remember, people only go to 
the people only hear the politicians on radio. In the time of magsaysay, they are around. They are shaking hands. You know, Alamano, right? Alamano, they shake hands. In Ilocano, that's called Alamano. They shake hands, they kiss babies, they go around. And this is where the elections in the Philippines started to become showbiz. Because magsaysay, you know, the, the one of the guys, who's that guy? Uh, in the CIA, he asked Raul Manglapos to make a jingle. A uh, first political jingle in the Philippines. And it was called Mambo Magsaysa. You know, the old ladies were horrified. The, the old ladies were horrified. Oh, they were the defense secretary. Why is there a song about him? And they danced the Mambo. Everywhere that you would look was a bandit or a crook. Peace and order, what a joke. Till Magsaysay pumaso. That is why, that is why. You would hear the people cry, our democracy will die. Kung wala si Magsaysay, if there is no Magsaysay. Mambo, mambo, Magsaysay. Mambo, mambo, mabuhay. Our democracy will die. Kung wala si Magsaysay. And you know, people really liked it. And boom, Magsaysay was elected against Quirino, who was very old at the time, very competent, but very old, and he was sick. Not very old, he was sick. And so, Magsaysay, of course, was supposed to be in the next elections. Some of the, because he bolted out of the Liberal Party, so he became Nationalista Party, but some of the Liberals also wanted him as president. So he would have won. He would have been the first president since Quezon to win a second term. But of course, that did not happen because he was killed in a car, in a plane crash in Cebu. So we lost him there. That guy was very important in our history because he, the masses felt that, you know, a president list, uh, was able to listen to them. Now, uh, that's just one case. Uh, I, I, I think I will conclude soon because, you know, uh, no, I'm, I'm not supposed to show you. I, I, there's a slide here about the Maguindanao massacre and I will not show you because they're really broken bodies. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, yeah, I, I just want to show you some pictures of uh, Magsaysay. Because, you know, if you're going to look at the Maguindanao massacre, it's the same kind of impunity that they thought they have. Rafael Laxon have that they, they can get away with such big crime. Like crime. You know, like the Maguindanao massacre in 2009. So this was Magsaysay and this was Edward Lansdale. There you go. Edward Lansdale. Yeah. When you see the face, you will remember the name. The name is the face. Edward Lansdale. And the guy is just you know, shaking hands. You know. Then was Raul Manglapos who, who sang the jingle and all of that. Huh? You know Nino Yakino? Nino Yakino borrowed the chopper of his rich wife <laughs> to go around the country so that he will win number two senator. Uh, number two senator. Uh, and of course, Marcos. Um, oh, this was something, you know. Uh, this is a uh, another election. You know, I I'll tell you, you no. Know, in Ilocos Sur, there's the war between relatives, Chrysologos and the Singsons. You know Chabit Singson now? And uh, Bingbong Chrysologo was the son of uh, Ploro Chrysologo, the congressman. Look at in the house of Ploro Chrysologo. I will tell you something. This is prevalent at that time. This is Ploro Chrysologo. The, the slogan is ballots, bullets, and beads. <laughs> Keep the ballots, oh Lord, make us keep the ballots clean to help our people. Use the bullets well to defend the oppressed. Pray the beads always to save our soul. God! Did you see that? <laughs> that's, that's, you know, admitting to guns, goons, and gold and praying to the Lord, Lord, bless us, guns, goons, and gold. <laughs> you see? In the Philippines, this is uh, prevalent. At that time, they were more forthright. <laughs> uh, 
I'm sorry. I hope, you know, maybe the MVP will think twice in inviting me again to do a talk because of what I'm doing now. <laughs> laughing and laughing, you know. Anyway, so of course, eventually there would be politics, there, uh, po political killings there because eventually Floro Quesologo will be gunned down while having mass. I'm sorry, I cannot show that. Uh, but, you know, they're now friends with each other, you know those warring factions there. Of course, another election-related violence would be the bombing of the Plaza Miranda, in which nine people were killed in the Liberal Party uh, uh, um, proclamation rally in Manila, August 21, 1971. Uh, we will skip the violence there. Uh, when Marcos declared martial law, um, he said that it was the most democratic time in Philippine history because their elections were ano, uh, barangay. They, their elections were barangay-led. And uh, the elections during that time, remember, there was a time when our elections during martial law, it was the raising of the hands. <laughs> so do you? There, there are elections that happened in the barangay where, the, for example, the 1973 constitution referendum, they said, who wants to... Uh, who wants to uh, approve the 1973 constitution? Raise your hands. Okay, so raise your hands. But some, in some areas, they ask other things according to stories. According to stories. Some eyewitness. They said, who wants to have a uh, uh, free rise? Raise your hand. Woo! And they, 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 you know, they have that. They take pictures. Of the who wants to have a uh, pre rise, raise your hand, and they will make a picture. And the 1973 constitution was approved. <laughs> who wants to see Nora Honor? Raise your hand. Nora Honor, we want to see Nora Honor. The 1973. And there are other referendums. There are many referendums during the time of Marcos. Who wants to him to extend his power? He wants to. A lot of. Ano, provisions in the constitution they were able to change because of that uh, hocus pocus uh, raising of the hands and also there was of course the laban the, the interim batasang pambansa elections wherein uh, uh, Nino Aquino actually challenged Imelda and all 10 I think 11 or 12 seats all of them lost to Imelda and people who, who were unknown in Metro Manila uh, that is when Chris Aquino emerged as a adept campaigner at a very young age for his fa for her father. You know, um, of course, Marcos called for a snap elections, uh, for snap elections uh, in 1986, and uh, uh, that was like a medieval morality play uh, between the battle of good versus evil, as they said, and there were a lot of cheating that happened. Some people were paid 50 pesos uh, to go to rallies and to vote for the president. Uh, this is an actual photograph, actual photograph, my dear friends, of a uh, of, of goons who stole ballot boxes. And this is an actual photograph of a goon using his gun to steal the ballots. But be, even with this kind of violence, and a lot of people dead, Nafran volunteers were killed. A lot of people actually defended the ballot boxes huh? with their lives. So this is how I actually end uh, my uh, presentations to some of our people. Uh, when I show them how hard it is to actually um, um, secure democracy in our country, some people sacrifice their lives. Please watch this clip from the 1986 SNAP presidential elections. Voters' lists scrambled massively, disenfranchised more than 3 million voters in opposition bailiwicks nationwide. We are not listed. We are not listed. There are plenty of upstairs are looking for their names. I have all my ID here, but they won't let me vote. We have been voting here ever since. Now my mother and me, the, our names were not listed here. We cannot 
that vote and we show this as, as evidence that we have been voting here. But since 7 o'clock this morning we were here, but then our nights were not here. Nampro became the word of the hour. In the ensuing anger and confusion as reports of violence and terrorism multiplied. This is one such incident. Suddenly, the orderly conduct of the elections was shattered by armed men who attacked the polling places. After one grabbed the other one, and the other one grabbed the other one. And so we all entered the precincts and locked the door, but we could hear the fighting and the noise. And so we were afraid they could open this door, so we went to the veranda, so we did not see any more. But all the while they could open the door and tackle everything, but at least in our precincts we were able to save our ballot boxes. It was more of the same in the countryside, like Tarlac province, home of the warlord and presidential crony, Eduardo Cojuanco. Um, so if you're going to look at it, uh, and I, I let people realize this, there are actually teachers in the 1995 elections like Mrs. Tatlong Javi, who was gunned down because he re she refused to give away the ballot box. There are people, there are teachers who actually were burned alive because when the armed goons went to the school to get the ballot boxes, they burned the school and they tried to save the ballot boxes, went to the comfort rooms. And they did not know, but they eventually, you know, they were burned. Um, when I tell these stories to people, I always uh, ask them to look at how we Filipinos were able to defend the ballot and how it was before that we did not have that kind of power during colonial times but now we have it you will not you will not use it you will just don't mind it i mean we should be we should we should we should pay tribute to our ancestors we should pay tribute to our heroes hmm? uh, when we go to the ballot boxes when, I mean, when we go to the polling places, uh, that is what we should uh, uh, be able to do. Uh, when and 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 I always tell people, and some people would say, "I am only one vote. Why, why is my import? Why is my vote important?" And and, and I actually got it. I got this from a uh, Lasengo. You know, I listened to a Lasengo conversation. And the Lasengo, the Lasengo, the drunkard in the street, said to one of his uh, kababayan who was also a Lasengo, you know why I want to vote? People are saying, you know, your vote is only one. And why are you so proud of that vote? Why, why, do you, why don't you want to sell that vote? You know, because uh, that one vote was, uh, I gave it with, with my honor and my, 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 when I thought well about it and I gave it with honor. And that he also said that, you know, uh, Jaime Sobel de Ayala, Jaime Augusto Sobel de Ayala, one of the richest men in the country, have one vote. And I have one vote as well. Diba? That means that in the elections we are, we are pantay pantay, we are equal. And that the vote of the richest man in the in the, one of the richest men in the Philippines is as important as my vote. That is what I tell them. 
And hopefully, we are able to convince some to actually really think about their vote. I would like to end with a quote from uh, uh, Corazon Cojuan Coaquino. In the speech in the U.S. Congress, he said, You saw a nation armed with courage and integrity stand fast by democracy against threats and corruption. You saw women poll watchers break out in tears as armed goons crash the polling places to steal the ballots out. Just the same, they tied themselves to the ballot boxes. You saw a people so committed to the ways of democracy that they were prepared to give their lives for its pale imitation. At the end of the day, before another wave of fraud could distort the results, I announced the people's victory. And this is where she showed the world how we Filipinos love democracy with the way we vote. And we should always continue and strive to do the same for the years to come. Thank you very much and good morning. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was very, very, very informative. So we will, uh, as uh, we had intended, we will try to make this as much of a question and answer yes. section as possible. And we do have something in the chat box from Mr. Bobby Gutierrez. Bobby, please. Hello, hi, I'm saying hello from New York. Mr. Zhao Chua, class of 1974 po. Sa UP? DLSU. Ah, DLSU, Animo La Salpo. Animo La Salpo. Although I must say, I'm, and I'm proud of it, I am at least 31 years older than you. <laughs> <laughs> now, my question is, are historians being consulted by the Comelec in evaluating a prospective candidate's application? Shouldn't they be involved? Uh, but this also, this also begs the question, perhaps <laughs> should be answered first. Has the Comelec lost all credibility? Well, the problem is that uh, the Comelec is as good as the people who are running it. So there are, there are Comelec there are, there are times when the Comelec has so much credibility because people like Heidi Yorak and Christian Monson were, were there. But remember that since the Comelec commissioners are appointed by the president, it can also be political. Uh, now, I do not discount the, uh, the, what do you call this? I do not discount the dedication the hard work of the people in the lower echelons of the COMELEC, the, the, the common election officers and workers. But, you know, sometimes, you know, just between us here in this room, they, sometimes they, they, they also tell me of the stories of some of their leaders. That's one. Uh, and of course, because the, some of the officers are appointed by the president, that, that means also that uh, in their decision making, they can also be beholden. And uh, I do not want again. The, I do not want to say that the Comelec as a whole lost its credibility, but there are some suspicions about some of the members in the past, in the present. So and 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 this is this is important. It's crucial because um, these people are managing the automated elections now the automated elections can um can prevent a lot of the grassroots cheating that is happening because of the past transmission of the results but you know god knows what they can do with their servers and all of that because you know people who, like us who do not understand how it works we can we can be we can we can we can lose sight of how it is done in a well, larger can, scale in a massive scale rather you than can, you know people looking at the ballot boxes and counting them manually and then putting uh, going to the town and people still watch how it was done so we really do not know but you know cheating is minimized eh, by 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 the lack of uh, human intervention 
Well, the, the case in the States, the matter of Diebold Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, the elections of the, when Bush was uh, oh, Al yeah. Gore, Bush right. versus Al Gore. There was a lot of, uh, you know, questions about that. But the, the question I have just as a follow-up is, if uh, isn't it enough that the disqualification, the clear-cut disqualification of Bong Bong Marcos mm -hmm. run, isn't that enough to make the conflict okay. lose credibility? Isn't there that is enough? A, there's an article by Professor Contreras, Antonio Contreras, of, uh, is that Antonio? I forgot. Professor Contreras, si Tonton, Tonton, Antonio Contreras, of uh, La Salle, that uh, there is actually a debate on what uh, constitutes moral turpitude. Because in the disqualification, it states that uh, the he was convicted but was it a crime of moral turpitude so th that is why i think that is where they 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 were able to do such kind of decision and uh, again it can be a political one because they are averting a much more shall we say perilous because my reading of it is they are avoiding a much more perilous position of, uh, I mean, perilous situation of uh, of maybe a an almost civil war when that happens. Because it, it, there's still a lot of groundswell support for Bongbong Marcos. So I, I don't know if, if that also comes into play. Because as, as you know, it should only be the rules and the rules alone and the law that should come into play. But again, in a political sense, we all know that that is not always the case. So, but uh, in this, in your first question, are historians being consulted by the Comelec? You know, remember that the Comelec have very little uh, qualifications for people who are running. They don't even require a a college diploma. They don't even re if you can read and write, you can understand I think English and Filipino. Uh, you are a resident for a many number of years. So I do not really think that historians will be consulted about this because uh, remember that sometimes we have to remember that uh, the, the rules will be the one who will decide to avert such uh, unobjective uh, uh, views about certain candidates. But remember that they also decide about uh, nuisance candidates. And they decide nuisance candidates based on the capability to actually wage a campaign in a national level. So that is why I think they have, I, I really, do, I'm not privy on how they decide it, but they have uh, technical qualifications on who are deemed uh, nuisance candidates. So, but historians, again, because of the technicality of it, will not be part of it because it, it's not the morality that they judge there, but the capability to actually campaign. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you also. And uh, I'd like to ask Susie now. Susie, please. There's another question from the, or comment from the chat box. Susie, yeah. Can you give me some water? Uh, if Susie's not yet ready, yeah, there. I think she's appearing. Hi there. Thank you, Hi, Professor Susie. Chow, for that very, uh, a very important talk. Yeah. Where's that coming out? I don't know. We can so, hear you. I. Yes. Um, thank you for that very interesting talk, uh, Professor Chow. You really woke us up this morning, uh, especially about the importance of being able to ballot, uh, to, to vote. No, uh, My grandmother was one of those suffragists who really uh, campaigned for women to have that privilege to vote. So uh, in our family, we take it very seriously. Anyway, I wanted to uh, uh, amend to that question of Bob about the historians. Um, 
what, uh, number one, I don't know if I've asked this already, but what can be done to bring history back to its importance in the school curriculum? That's the first question. And the second is, um, what are historians doing to counter this uh, revisionism? Okay, very uh, good I mean, questions. if everybody had access to something like what you mm -hmm. talked about today. Okay. Uh -huh. Very good questions. Uh, number one, uh, we have to work as a group because individual historians do not really have a force. But if we have a group, like, for example, the Philippine Historical Association, where I am currently a board member, uh, board of governor and the uh, and, uh, um, public relations officer, we actually held uh, a dialogue with the Secretary of Education, Leonor Magtolis Briones. And she actually accepted, she, I mean, she physically accepted our petition to study the effects of K plus 12, which was implemented, I am sorry to say, under the Noy Noy Aquino administration, to take away high school from, uh, to take away uh, Philippine history from high school, which was because they thought that it, it should be spiral. So from your whole, your social studies is you study in the lower years, your home, your locality, your, your country, Asia, world, things like that. And they said that it, his Philippine history is repetitive. Oh, some of those uh, board members in the, so I, I mean, some of those who are this, deciding in the DepEd, Dina Ocampo, they were the ones. And of course, Secretary Armin Luis, to whom I like very much. But uh, one of our board members actually asked him, can you study the implications of what you did in the Philippine history now? Because people now uh, ha uh, have a different view of history, the young people, because of this, uh, this uh, mistake that was made. But I will tell you something. The curriculum people have reviewed, and I think they did not find anything to change it. And so we still have, we, 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 they just concluded the review and, and nothing was done about the Philippine history in high school. And so how do, we, what is the next step then? We had a dialogue with the Committee of Education Chair of House of Representatives, or one of the members, uh, Congressman Roman Romulo. Because Roman Romulo was pushing for the inclusion of World War II in the college curriculum because they have taken it out in the readings in Philippine history. There was no World War II. And so people are saying, we study about Rizal, but why don't we study World War II, which is nearer, nearer to us? And so when we opened that dialogue, we also said that, you know, why, why, why not? Because they wanted in the proposal to put World War II, half of Philippine history is World War II. And we said, we cannot agree to that. I mean, it should be level playing field to all, to all the parts of history in the Philippines. You cannot just privilege one. That's what we said. And then, but, but the, the reason why was really because Roman Romulo was angry. Because there was no World War II in the history. In the readings, because there was a selection of readings and they left out World War II in the selection of readings because in the readings in Philippine history, it's not supposed to be a comprehensive view of Philippine history, but how you, uh, how you, how you analyze sources, which for me is bullshit. I think it should be both. It should be both content and how to analyze sources and content means a comprehensive view of Philippine history. And so what we are doing uh, twofold, number one, yeah, we talk to lawmakers. This is our case. Uh, that we should bring back Philippine history in high school. Uh, we should put more uh, Philippine history in our curriculum. But also there is a movement, a groundswell movement from teachers called High School Philippine History Movement. This is in Facebook. High School Philippine History Movement was uh, started by an Atenean, Ateneo high school teacher named Jamaico Ignacio. And this has now received a lot of uh, help and, and, and support and they actually are now studying proposals that they are going to give to the Department of Education so that they can include Philippine history, but not repetitive. If there would be a thematic Philippine history wherein a lot of the 
important history uh, parts are are taken i, I mean are, are 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 given or 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 studied now so this is where we are now there are uh, people like the philippine historical association the high school philippine history movement who are talking to congressmen talking to the dep ed to you know we, we were just you know ringing the bell to tell people you know we have a problem here number two question uh is there anything done all of us are doing our best all of us have already created content i am a public historian and i've done a lot of content since 2011. uh a lot of the historians are doing content now even in tiktok uh, just so we can reach the people but why is it not having an effect i will tell you something because this is beyond information and data the data is available in fact, a lot of the Marcos supporters know about what happened during martial law. But they are saying this. Um, we believe that uh, Marcos did not steal because any, uh, uh, we believe that probably Marcos stole, but uh, anyone is stealing anyway. Everyone is stealing anyway. So we'll just elect someone who was able to steal and was able to build something than a person who did not build anything. People are actually inundated with infrastructure. Their, 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 their uh, concept of someone who accomplished a lot of things is someone who was able to build a lot of infra. And that is why Gloria knew about that and Duterte knows about that. That's why they, uh, they, they put in their, these two presidents after Marcos, put in their centerpiece uh, in their administration, build, build, build. So that's that's one. Number two, because of the frustrations with the democracy after Edsa Revolution, that a lot of the powerful were able to appropriate it only for selfish means. Like our electoral system was hijacked by the powerful. The justice system was hijacked by the powerful. What happened? The ordinary people actually have a, a first the people power fatigue with Edsa Dos, Edsa Tres. Number two, that they felt that this democracy has done us no good, that it did not solve the problems that it, it's supposed to solve. Uh, and that's why even if you feed them information, they will just say, EDSA was a mistake. It was a mistake to take away Marcos. We should have been a dictatorship because democracy doesn't work. So I think, Susie, Mom Susie, the problem is more than education. Susie, la. <laughs> yeah. The problem is more than education. The problem really is we will only believe in democracy if we will make democracy work. And we can only do that if the right leaders will be chosen in 2022. That is at stake. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, before we go any further, can I please ask, everybody to unmute their video so we can take a picture uh oh, yeah let's have a picture this first is our, yes. our graduation day so i uh, would like to take a, a graduation picture cherry uh, can we have the gallery view on screen please Please send me this, okay, so that I can have a souvenir. Yes. Souvenir. You're part of it. You're part Thank of you it. Thank you so much. Okay, gallery. Everybody <laughs> unmute, please. Unmute your videos. In the gallery. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Justin, you can rent to Karena, Justin. Para may backup tayo. <laughs> okay, guys. Si Aurora, parang wala. Oh, bakit wala si Aurora? Aurora. <laughs> Aurora. Aurora, where are you? 
Is a mama at the people in Japan? There she is. Oh, take us. Ah, sorry, I I don't know. I lost my connection for a few seconds. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, left. Oh. One, two, three, smile. Wow, thank you. Uh, okay. Su Susie is not there. Ah, si Susie naman nawawala. <laughs> Here, I'm still here. Okay, okay one, two, two, three. Page two. All righty. Okay, we're good. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. 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 Hello. Uh, yes. Rita. Yes, thank you. Used to believe. <laughs> so, magandang umaga. And thank you very, very much. I did enjoy this talk. Actually, I'm going to even ask for a recording because I would like to share this with my family who is here with me. So, I come from Finland mm -hmm. and I'm here since only August. So, I'm quite a newcomer. And Okay, Finland was just voted fifth time in a row, the world's happiest country. And looking at like, you know, if you walk around Finland or you walk around here, uh, looking at the faces of people, you would think it's the opposite. Because the Finns don't necessarily smile a lot, but they're here in the Philippines, you know, you just always have the happy faces and people are smiling so much. And I love your laughter. Um, but. I think really, of course, the truth is that one of the reasons why we, we keep on, you know, being considered the happiest nation for so many years in a row is number one, uh, lack of corruption. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest problems here. Like I, I felt in a moment, I felt like this was such a depressing end to our wonderful series of Filipino history, which has, of course, other dark moments as well but I thought oh my gosh this is like too much I mean I felt like I'm looking at a Netflix show and this cannot be happening looking at the things that are happening here now and fearing for the next elections Game of Thrones but, sorry Ga this is Game of Thrones yeah, in sure. reality <laughs> exactly but then on the other hand I felt like very hopeful and very powerful because of you know what you showed in the video uh, the film, I mean, not the video, like the real film, and what you were saying about how people were defending the ballot boxes. I mean, this is the, the, the people who are standing up for their rights and who are really, you know, believing and doing everything they can for their belief. Of course, you know, sacrificing their lives, unfortunately, also sometimes. But I mean, this gives us hope. So let's hope that the Filipino people will have so many heroes this time as well. So thank you very much to you and thank you very much to MVP. I've had to watch most of these as recordings because I've been uh, very busy <laughs> since I've arrived. And then also I've been in Finland a few times. So with the time difference, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank thank you Rita. Uh, we do have other, others who are unmuted. Uh, Mama. Aurora. Um, thank you again, Professor Michael Shaochua, um, for always supporting MVP. We love you, and we know, um, you know, you can always come back for any lecture. You cover so much. Thank you. So much. Uh, I don't know. Um, for the first time in history, I feel I. I really feel it. I and mean, then there is such a proliferation of fake news that all of a sudden it has become um, accepted, almost expected, um, you know, to have a, an information war. You don't know what is true, what is a lie anymore. Um, everything is okay. You can tell lies on TV. Um, 
I mean, just uh, take uh, President Trump's um, big lie of, um, you know, a fraudulent um, election that saying that he won. And now we have the information war with the war in Ukraine, um, propaganda war with uh, Bong Bong Marcos and all the candidates. Um, so I can see how historians really make a very important role uh, in this time of history. So what, how do you see this? I mean, for the common Filipino to exercise their um, critical thinking and not just be swayed by propaganda or even you know, people worldwide, not not just to um, depend on one source, but to listen to different sources and you know decide on what is true. How do you see it? Well, um, how do I see it? First, uh, they were able to do it because uh, they, as as Joseph Goebbels said, you know, when when you repeat the a lie you know, uh, as many times, uh, it will become the truth. Uh, mm -hmm. You repeat a lie more often, it will become the truth. So, uh, for many people, it has become the truth. Uh, it's not even propaganda. They don't even see the difference. Um, now, again, why is that? Because, I will tell you, the for many, many years now, because the academe, the institutions of school, like the University of the Philippines, for example, or even La Salle or Ateneo, and a lot of the schools. Um, first, there was always this notion that when you go to school, you do not understand the people. And so, uh, and sometimes I was, I have a fault that I was also part of it. This movement when we call people elitists because they have Western education and and they have uh, and they do not understand the people and sometimes that is true. They, sometimes they really do not. They're so they're so condescending about Filipinos. But uh, in many ways, this was taken to another level by the by political players, by the PR, by saying that if you are educated, you are uh, you do not see. Uh, the people, you have elitista, and uh, the problem now lies is that uh, we Filipinos now have this. A, a lot of a lot of Filipinos now they felt that the educational system is discredited. You know, they always say that UP people are uh, communists. You see, this is very effective. So, if before people want to go to UP to be edu to to have an education that is excellent, now. What would those poor pro bong bong Marcos people will think now? They they their minds are poisoned already. That when you go to UP, you will become a communist, which is a long time problem. This is a long time perception. Now, yesterday, I will tell you, two two progressive um, bookshops were already you know red tagged, like they sprayed red paint in the signs of the front signs of these bookstores npa terrorist you know what i i remember remember the book burning in the time of the nazis they first came for the books and then they sprayed paint on the jews jewish shops in the time of the nazis in germany i, I felt afraid because they have discredited education in a whole and that they tell you that if you want to know the real story of history, you go to TikTok and you go to you know YouTube and you go and look at their uh, uh, the stories that they say. So, what is now what what is what is now uh, the next move or the next way the next thing that we can do? Of course, historians can only do so much. Yeah. We do not have the power, we do not have the PR machinery, and boy oh boy, we have let our, our, our expertise be used already by a lot of these uh, people who wanted to help us. And also, our content is in YouTube. It's all there, but 
we are prevented to reach more people because of algorithms because they, these people like in the Cambridge Analytica and this is worldwide we, they can buy uh, algorithms so that they can target people content so it's a very deep problem that is actually beyond our control because we can only do so much now my only hope really is that just like before you know there, there were times that Jose Rizal was being maligned by the left in the schools they say that he was not a real hero he was a traitor and all of that but eventually that dissipated and I do hope that with, that sometime people will come to their senses and say, um, maybe what, the, what we learned from YouTube, TikTok, social media was wrong. I hope that there will come a time. But that also means that we need more materials. We need to work harder. Even if it's beyond our control, we have to believe that everything that we do, the discussions that we do, will have an effect. That the, the materials that I write for newspapers, the interviews that I give on television, will eventually have an effect. That people will come to their senses. But we can only do that if we are working. Because we cannot let these people just have the narrative, control the narrative. Uh, we, can, we, we can only do our best, but we will do that best for that narrative to be written, for that right narrative of history to be retained so yes it's it, it also uh we we should also remind people that we should just not get one source or you should look at the credibility of sources we do that but uh, again um there should also be good governance from people who peddle the narrative of people power uh so that people will believe us again people will believe educational institutions again so we cannot allow a presidency that if a presidency wins by peddling lies, we all know that they're going to peddle lies when they are in power. There can never be another way. Kasi parang akala natin, oh, maybe when they, sit, when, they, when they are in power already, they will stop because they already won. We, we cannot have that hope. So we should all work, work, work. And thank you, MVP, for being... A big part of that work because you know uh, all of uh, all of you are influencers in many many ways and there are people you talk to and and because we, when you have this right kind of history and you put this in the conversation then uh, maybe we can have uh, we can we can we can uh, convince people one at a time one person at a time Yes, one person at a time. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Sony Nang has a uh, comment, a uh, question. Um, Sony, please. Yeah. Uh, Sony. Uh, Tony? Yeah. Tony? Tony? Yeah. Okay. This is Tony. Yeah. Tony and then Sony. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. I guess in 1986, um, the voters uh, knew that there was cheating and were willing to risk their lives to uh, to, to to protect um, uh, the truth. These days, um, it seems that the voters are very susceptible to believing lies and mm -hmm. seem to be swayed by the money that is uh, flowing around. Mm -hmm. So that is a very big change from 1986 right. to, in the voter from 1986 to now. So would you say that uh, there has been a deterioration mm -hmm. in the quality of the Filipino voter? What led to this change and what uh, can we do about it? I think there's a deterioration of the quality in society in general, in some aspects, not in everything, because I do not want to say that, you know, everything in post ends had failed. Uh, it would be inaccurate to say that. But in terms of um, a government that responds to the needs of the people, I think uh, a lot of people found it lacking. And so, uh, and so what's happening now is because they have a different way of looking at politics, that would also um, um, 
that would also inform the way they vote. Now, let me be more clear about this. Uh, a lot of actually, a lot, because, because people cannot stop vote buying, because our system cannot stop vote buying. A lot of our leaders actually just admitted that vote buying is rampant, prevalent, since we cannot stop it. We went, our politicians, and I will say all of them, including my candidate, all of them went to as far as saying that because we cannot stop vote buying, you just accept the money. <laughs> accept the money and vote for the right candidate. Okay, I will tell you something. Vote buying doesn't just work one time. Okay, I will tell you something. This is something I learned from cultural workers. It's not a one-time thing. You know, I'll give you money, you vote. No, inaalagaan. They take care of their potential voters. So, of course, at first, in, I mean, again, it's not considered vote buying if you give money outside the election period. And the election period is only a few days in the local. So, that means beyond that, you can give money. So, of course, if you give money in a regular basis or you give opportunities in a regular basis, Oh, that means that you are now going to vote for certain candidates because the support was was constant. It's it's not a one time big time thing. Although there are there are there are there are times when it is a one time big time. But but you know how can the local go because you know the barangay captains sometimes have to ensure that they vote the way they want. And so how do you do that? You have to monitor your people in the barangay. How they vote. And if you are assured that a certain number of people are already, you know, help was given for some time, then definitely you get their vote. So vote buying is not a one-time, big-time thing. It, it's really something that is, in, uh, uh, is, is done uh, systematically. So... If people consider it help, people consider it ayuda, then you got their hearts and they will vote for you. So I really do not think that we have, uh, uh, kasi ganito eh, we, we, sometimes uh, we look at politics black and white. But we all know that a lot of times it is really transactional. And, 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 in many ways, even with a lot of us, we vote not just looking at the country's interest, but also for other ways. And that is why we have to pound at, at, at other other reasons. I say because, you know, you know, that guy helped me when we had fire. So I have to vote for him because I want to tanaw utang na loob. There are, there are times when we do that. Or there are times when we... You know, I heard that this senator always allows people to, uh, always gives people assistance if they come. And so, you know, uh, that is that is ha ha sometimes how we vote. So, there are many reasons why people vote. I cannot judge them if we already deteriorated our uh, our political culture, but what I can say is that we are geared towards more real politic. And again, when we say real politic, it's your, ano tawag dito? It's your perception if it is bad or not. Because for some people, it's not, it's, it's not as bad. It's just real politic. So, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry to give you a vague answer, but I also do not want to judge my fellow men. I, I do not, I, I do not, I think I do not have the right to judge them, but uh, I also get what you, what I, I also get what you say, and I am also sad if there are some people. But again, we have no data din kasi. We're looking at perceptions. What if the electorate will make the right candidates win? It will still be seen during elections. So hopefully, let's pray. Let's let's distribute more alcohol, you know, uh, 
Uh, maybe we can convince people. Let's have great conversations, respectful conversations with people. We still convince, you know, those people who hate us, you know, go, you know, they, they can go themselves. You know? <laughs> but, you know, if there are people, we can still convince them. We can, we, we can talk to them. I'm sorry if my answer was lengthy, but it was a very hard question. Right. It was a very hard <laughs> question. So I have to. We, we enjoy the answers. Uh, our last. Comment question will be from Sony Nong, and then mm. after that, Cherry has a surprise for everybody. Yeah, Sony, please. Yes, thank you, Professor Chua, for the presentation. My question is uh, What do you think of surveys during this election? Uh -huh. uh, Pulse Asia, for one, admitted that they survey only the CDE crowd, mm -hmm. but not the AB crowd. So there's bias there. And uh, I don't know. I just want to ask your opinion about this service. Well, first of all, I would say this because I, I would like to be for, uh, upfront with you that uh, I am a fellow of the SWS. Uh, I, I, I am a fellow in the SWS, but I do not, I'm not part of their survey. Uh, no, I, 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 I am an academic and I, I sometimes give talks to, uh, with, with them as a fellow using SWS uh, data. Uh, that said, um, what I'm saying here is this. Um, you know, if they only survey the CD, I haven't read their admission. I haven't read their admission. Uh, Maybe I will, I will go back to it. During an interview. I will go back to it. But that is a flawed methodology. But also understandable because a and B are only just very few in our society. So um, we really do not, but, but that's disenfranchisement. Eh. Kailangan ang, ang, yes. ang survey mo across the board. Of course. Right? Because I, I think in SWS, our survey firm, maybe they do more across the board. But uh, do not be fooled also by the rallies. Because remember that the election, even if we are so passionate as supporters, is not decided by the supporters. It is decided by the soft voters who are still probably undecided until now. Or the soft voters because they are not as passionate as the supporters of each camp. Therefore, they can, they can move or they can sway the other way after, uh, in, in a few days. So um, there is, I'm uncomfortable to say that surveys might lead to uh, trending. Is it not trending? Uh, yung, when you, I, I forgot the term, but this is when you, when you try, when you, when bandwagon happens, and uh, you now vote a certain way, the surveys would, 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 would go. Snowball, but, huh? snowball, 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 or something, yeah. Uh, but I like that their surveys are around just to show us what more we can do. Because if we're still not reaching the numbers, we cannot be complacent, even with the large rallies of Lenny. Huh? We should be able to see the data because the data is the data. Uh, it's surveys, surveys are surveys, you know, meaning, you know, they're sa random sampling. You should look at it as such uh, surveys. And elections are not decided by surveys, but they are able to, uh, trending, that's the term, the trending. Uh, but we can also see that for many, many years, the data that was, uh, was close to what was in the surveys in the last at least in the last survey before the election but the surveys are also say telling us that you should take this as a with a grain of salt because uh the real survey will be the elections and the most the most the more accurate survey is actually the the exit poll survey but even that is just random sampling so maybe the right thing to do, we cannot take away surveys because surveys is always, surveys are actually useful. What we should see, which, what we should always tell people repeatedly is that surveys are just a slice of the picture. 
that it should not be taken as a a a a, a, a yardstick of who will win but either we should it should inform us how the things that we should work for more when it comes to convincing our electorate so ako for me i rather have the surveys be there with their methodology uh to see where we are rather than you know because data is it's social science it's statistics it's something that was already done for many many years and uh, we should just tell people na you know don't don't be swayed by surveys uh but even so surveys actually tell us who is the bigger enemy and maybe we can focus our attention to that rather than you know blindly fighting i really do not know but uh, i have an ambivalence about it actually so can you assure me that surveys cannot be bought okay um it, now i for one know that if they can be bought that means that okay the, the question the, the, the we should ask some questions here. what will the effect if there if you can actually buy surveys now you can commission surveys yes but to buy to to actually tell surveys we will pay you so that you will skew the data i think that would be not beneficial for them because that means that if them are is if you can really do that you know uh it will come out it will come out because all of these people are commissioning surveys eh? so so lalabas at lalabas yan and uh, what will happen is they will lose their credibility but there is still no credible assertion that they were able to buy the result of a survey but they can be commissioned diba? and they are forthright about their their uh, no their who commissioned them or what diba? so uh i think that uh um ano tawag dito? yes uh i believe i still believe at least with sws that they are not bought they can be commissioned but they be kasi ganito yan eh. if you give wrong results to people who commission you that is detrimental ano yun uh uh you will lose credibility bakit pa ako magpapa-survey sa iyo kung pwede na mong palitan yan di ba ang ang issue lang the only issue is if we're going to put out the survey or not <laughs> that's the only issue but i i do not believe that they skew data uh if if i commission a survey i have the decision if i will put it out or not that that is the case so yeah that, that, that pero pero it, it's detrimental to them to their business to their to their association to their to their uh, institution if they will if if they will be bought to to, to skew date uh yeah i think i think i have enough uh conviction uh to say that uh they can be commissioned but they cannot be bought to to skew date okay. <laughs> are you okay okay thank you so thank much you. thank you okay thank you thank you very very much professor tua and now uh the surprise of cherry cherry no cherry? it's it's aurora who's gonna run it because my ah, aurora. internet is intermittent oh aurora <laughs> aurora uh will play our next number our next number for our program <laughs> um all right um but first of all before we do that i would just like to uh, say what a, you know what better speaker than to have our beloved professor shao chua to end this year of um 2021 2022 um of the philippine history course 